Welcome to the last session in our fruit series. This one is going to cover plums, pluots, and cherries. We started with plums, prunes, and pluots, and we'll begin with a little bit of a, a plug, if you will, for why you should grow these fruits in your garden. So why we should all grow plums? Well, these are typically a very hardy tree. There are varieties that will grow in just about every part of the state, even if you've got some real weather constraints on you. They are um, really available in a wide variety of flavors, colors, textures. There should be one that appeals to just about everyone. And really they have few insect or disease problems, especially when compared with some of the other fruit trees that we like to grow. The fruit can be used in a number of different ways, eaten fresh, frozen, dried, etc. And did we mention that there are few insect or disease problems? Let's talk about definitions a little bit. So this is a, a quote that we pulled out of another class. All prunes are plums, but not every plum can be a prune. Now this has to do with the way that certain varieties of plums are processed. Some European prune plums will actually dry into the prune that we're familiar with eating as that dried fruit. Uh, Japanese plums, they can be dried, but they will not turn into that sort of sticky, sweet, condensed prune. They'll just be kind of like if you've ever had dried peaches, uh, that kind of texture. So European prune plums are the ones that will do that. And um, just a little bit about the differences. European plums must be pollinated by another European plum of some variety, and Japanese plums must be pollinated by another Japanese plum. And pluots are a really interesting and delicious fruit that's becoming more and more popular. And this is a hybrid plum apricot. And if you are growing these, some will require a plum for pollination and others will require either an apricot or another pluot. And when you're buying the, the tree itself, that information should be on the tag or you should be able to look that up before you purchase so that you know that you've got yourself covered as in terms of pollination. And just to let you know again that a pluot is not some sort of strange uh, creature grown in a lab. These are actually just hand crossed. Uh, through natural breeding, and uh, they produce this hybrid plum apricot, and they're really a wonderful fruit. So just a visual, up on the left you can see the European plum, and this is the one that if dried will turn into a prune, so you may hear them called prune plums or European plums. The one on the right, this is the Japanese plum. These are typically a little bit firmer in texture. They come in a lot of really bright colors like this one that's bright red inside, or the one that's red but bright yellow on the inside. If you like a tangy, almost sour plum, these are the ones that you'll probably really like. And then the pluot, this is that plum crossed with the apricot, so you get the texture of a plum but the sweetness of an apricot. They are really delicious and I um, really recommend that you try to uh, find them. So we said that they have few pest and disease issues. There are a couple I want to mention that we see fairly frequently on plums and, and uh, apricots and prunes, or not apricots, but plums and prunes, excuse me, and pluots. And one of them is a pretty minor pest, and this is the plum leaf curl aphid. Again, very descriptive name for this little insect that attacks mostly plums. Typically, by the time you notice the damage, the aphid has already moved on or been consumed by predators. You might get just some uh, some distorted growth at the tips of the leaves. There might be some stickiness and some insect presence. Nothing that a good insecticidal soap or a spray of water can't usually clear up if, the, if you catch it early enough. Another problem that we sometimes see with plums, and that is that peach tree borer that we talked about in the peaches and nectarines lecture. And just a refresher, usually the adults are emerging in early summer the best treatment is to ban the trunk with an, an insecticide so that the adults uh, fail to lay the eggs, or when the eggs are laid, they fail to hatch into the larva. But other than that, the plums and prunes and pluots are fairly simple. They don't require a lot of pruning, and they are typically very easy to grow, so really think about adding those to your garden. But now let's talk about cherries to finish it up. You have some options when you're growing cherries. You can either go with sweet or tart. So this is that, that big sweet black cherry versus a smaller, more tart pie cherry. We hardly ever see pie cherries grown anymore, but they can be so good. If you are a big canner or freezer, you can um, preserve those for pies and bake goods later on. You can also can them, but either one is a good option. 
Uh, pie cherries tend to be self-pollinating though, which can be nice if you have small space. They don't need a pollinator. And some pollinators are needed for sweet cherries. It just depends on the variety. So again, research and make sure that you either have two trees or there's a tree in your neighborhood or somewhere close by that can pollinate your tree. Um, though a lot of old trees don't tend to be dwarf, there are dwarfing rootstocks now for cherries, and that is really a good way to go. If you've ever looked up into a cherry tree and thought, I really wish I could get some of that fruit or pulled out the 10 foot ladder, you'll understand that having a dwarf tree is really, really a nice thing. It contains the size, it makes it easier to harvest, if you do need to do any kind of spray treatments, that makes it easier too. And uh, more cherries for you and less for the birds. And we'll talk about that in a minute. So there is one major issue with cherries, and that is the western cherry fruit fly. It is common in most parts of the state, especially the warmer regions. Um, it lays The little tiny fly will come and lay its eggs on the developing fruit, usually when they're kind of in the yellow, just starting to turn to gold phase. And um, the larvae will burrow into the fruit and spend its life cycle inside of that fruit. So you open up that beautiful cherry and there's a little white worm inside. And that's really off-putting to most people, even myself included. I don't like to eat wormy cherries. So what can we do about them? Well, you can grow an early maturing cultivar. Maybe not the, the sweetest one that you can find, but that can sometimes help you to avoid... Um, the fly and have your fruit mature before the fly becomes active. The other thing that the commercial orchardists usually have to do is to have a pretty rigorous spray schedule. So finding either an organic or a synthetic product that is listed for the cherry fruit fly, spraying it at the right time, and repeat spraying so that the fruit stays covered throughout the vulnerable period. And then the last one, this is really a joke, but just eat your cherries with your eyes closed and you'll never know that you have the, the fruit fly in there. But really, if you're giving them to friends or have any idea of selling the cherries or just want clean fruit, you are going to have to have a management schedule of some kind. A couple other issues with cherries. Now this one may or may not be a problem depending on what's causing it. So this is called gamosis and this is just a weeping or um, a time when the cherries are actually exuding sap. And this can happen for a couple of reasons. It might just be natural. Sometimes when things get going on in the spring, you can get some gumming coming out of some of the different pore spaces in that tree. Sometimes it's due to pruning, so you might have some gamosis coming out of a pruning cut or near a pruning cut. Uh, but the other thing is that stressed trees tend to produce more gum than non-stressed trees. So if you have a tree that's actually getting too much water or too much nitrogen fertilizer, that can lead to the gumming. And when it's really extreme, it could be a symptom of a bacterial disease. But if you just see a little gumming like what we're seeing here and it's clear and you don't see any dark spots on the trunk or on the branches, that's really not anything to worry about too much. And I just want to mention also that another issue with cherries, because they are smooth barked, is that you can sometimes get sun scald wounds during the winter on that, on that trunk. So if you have a young tree, it's really good to use a tree wrap or some sort of shield or even white paint to protect that trunk until it's about three or four years old and it's less susceptible to that damage. You can see in this next picture that trunk has been painted white and that is to prevent the sun scald or the southwest side disorder. So here's when gamosis goes a little bit too far or when it's indicative of a, of a bacterial problem and this is bacterial canker. So if you see gamosis and it's large like this, it's dark colored, you see dark sunken cankers on the stems or on the trunk, that may be a sign that you have the bacterial canker. Some species are more susceptible, and there is actually a resistant rootstock out there now. So if you are able to choose and you can find information on that, then and or if you've had this problem in your garden in the past and you're looking for a replacement tree, you certainly want that tree to be resistant. So you'll be looking for the F12-1 Mazard rootstock, and that'll be whatever variety you choose has been grafted onto that rootstock and usually it'll keep the tree smaller and it'll also be resistant to this bacterial canker. If the canker is on an upper branch or a lateral branch, you can prune out the infection. In this photo here, if you were to prune out the infection, you would probably remove the whole tree. So that may not be an option. In that case, you might want to treat with copper fungicides at the right time. And I encourage you to refer 
to the Pacific Northwest uh, Pest and Disease Handbooks that we've linked to in the course materials. So you can get really precise information on what materials you would apply and on the timing. So just a little bit about pests. Uh, birds love cherries as much as we do. And there are lots of things out there on the market that are designed to scare away the birds and protect your fruit. Some of them are going to be more effective than others. And everyone's going to tell you their favorite method from um, automatic um, shotgun recordings <laughs> that are played out in the orchard to hanging old CDs and DVDs that sparkle in the sun to putting uh, fake birds out there, whatever you need to do. Uh, one of the most effective ways, though, is to net that tree and to put bird netting over the entire tree. Uh, if you have a small tree, again, this is that benefit of having a small tree is that you could actually net it. You may also just net a portion of the tree and let the birds have some cherries. But if you don't do anything, then you're, you're going to be fighting the birds for access to that fruit. All right, and so that concludes the portion on plum, plums, pluots, and uh, cherries.